What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike to the channel. Welcome, bike to the headquarters. This is B D G E. Big dogs got e fantasy football. My name is Nicholas. It is Thursday, which means it is a mock draft, a 2020 fantasy football live mock draft on underdog fantasy. Number one place to do best ball drafts. The number one place to practice for your fantasy football drafts. I can promise you that because all of the leagues are $3 to join. The best part about best ball is you could join 75 of them. You don't have to do any in-season management. You throw your money in, you draft, which is the best part of fantasy football, doing the actual draft, and then you come bike at the end of the year and collect your winnings. We are on Underdog Fantasy in the App Store by literally just searching Underdog Fantasy fantasy and if you're going to throw in 10 bucks when you deposit to come draft with me what i would love for you to do is do this is do a little thing like this after you deposit you're going to see a page that says who referred you if you don't hate me you could throw big dogs bdge in the partner i have a code thing and submit it in there if not it's all good it's all gravy i hope you guys find some valuable information from this video today now we're going to join the 12 team $3 best ball draft, which is a fast draft, 30 seconds on the clock for each pick. I val enter this. I'm going to throw it into our Discord channel so that we can get some homies from the Discord. We can fill up this draft rather quickly. I'm going to, we got six of 12. Maybe I'll tweet it out as well. Let's talk about some, some COVID updates because I'm a, technically a doctor. Matthew Stafford off the IR COVID list. We have Justin Jefferson off the IR COVID list. We have Gardner Minshew who says COVID took one look at him and then ran away. Take that for wherever the fuck you want to. Let's see, Will Disley passes his physical. Jordan Reed signs with the 49ers. T.Y. Hilton pulls a hamstring. Drink. One more. Let's go, big dogs. We got the sauce. We put asses in seats. We put asses in drafts. Hey, we are filled. Let's go. And your boys got the 104. I love that spot. We love it. We love it. We love it because we're getting a baller running back. Let me move me over here, make myself a little bigger, which makes the video more aesthetic because you get to look at me on a larger scale. And we're ready to kick this bad boy off. If we are on the clock. It's early in the morning, so I'm going to stop yelling for you guys. Make sure your shirts are tucked in. As per usual, the drafts start off with Christian McCaffrey and Saquon Barkley. If you are new to my channel, then you've probably never seen a best ball mock draft. If you are new to best ball, I will explain what this means in a second. So we are on the clock at the 104, and I think this is just an easy smash right here on Ezekiel Elliott. I would have went with Alvin Kamara over Ezekiel Elliott. If you listened to last video on my channel, we talked about Alvin Kamara being probably the prime bounce back candidate of the year. Given the high ankle sprain that he suffered, he was the single most elusive running back in football prior to his high ankle sprain. Then he has the high ankle sprain. His elusive rating drops to RB40. Okay. Latavius Murray didn't take the goal line work. He didn't take any of the pass catching work within the 10. That is still Alvin Kamara's role. It's still his job. He's scoring double digit touchdowns this year. He's, he's catching 81 passes. He caught 81 passes last year for the third season in a row in 14 games. So his catches per game were actually the highest of his career last year. Do not hesitate to take Kamara at the three. Do not hesitate to take Zeke at the four. Easy smash there. So we see Clyde Edwards Hilaire go off at the 106. Is that too high? No, I don't think so. That's about the tier that I have him in. I have him in with the Miles Sanders, the Dalvin Cooks. You know, depending on your league settings, it's going to be a little bit different in terms of like where you have your running back rankings. So I'm getting like a lot of Miles Sanders versus Clyde Edwards Hilaire. In a full PPR, I'm going to go with Miles Sanders over Clyde. But in the other settings, I'm likely going with Clyde over Miles Sanders. The upside in that offense is just too, too great to pass up on. Clyde in the 106 is probably about where you're going to see him go off in, in the majority of drafts. Now, for these best ball drafts, these are, these are long. You got to have stamina, endurance, and commitment to get through these, okay? The same for everybody. But if you're in my audience and these things are fucking built for you, I've prepared, I've prepared you for your whole life to get through these fucking drafts, all right? We're going to get through this one together. Because these are 18 rounds. There are no kickers. There are no defenses. These are just straight skill players in your face hole. Quarterback, running back, 
wide receivers, tight ends. You start one quarterback, so this is not super flex. You start two running backs, three wide receivers, one tight end. Again, you make no in-season moves, okay? There's no trades. There's no waiver wire pickups, and that's why you draft a very big team. The software on Underdog Fantasy, again, that's where you can find it in the App Store. It's both on, I believe, Google, Android, and in iOS, Underdog Fantasy. It starts the highest scoring player at each position, that number of players each week. And whoever's got the highest total at the end of the year, based on the software automatically starting it, will take home Zimani. Okay. And the reason why these are so good and these are so fun to do and fucking unbelievably addicting, the app is beautiful, by the way. Uh, typically, I would draft on the the mobile app, but obviously I can't screenshot that. Super addicting because everyone has to throw money on the drafts, right? They are mock drafts, kind of, but you're also playing for money, which means everybody's taking this shit seriously, okay? You'll get a real, real view for how players are being projected, their actual ADP, what it's going to be like when you're in real drafts. This is why I say this is the number one place to be prepping for your fantasy football drafts. So we're seeing a, a large mix of wide receivers, a large mix of Running backs, mainly running backs. We finally had our first tight end go off the board in Travis Kelsey. I want to talk about George Kittle for a second once he goes off the board. I'm not taking George Kittle for the reasons that I'm going to lay out in a second. Okay, Daddy Flex got took George Kittle, which leaves me. I have absolutely no shares of Aaron Jones in best ball because I think the 2-9 is too early for me, given that he's going to be in a committee. But I always talk about diversifying the revenue. I want to get my running backs early because once you get to the fourth, fifth, sixth round, it is an absolute shit show at the position while there are about 38 wide receivers to choose from. So, you know, I don't I don't suggest doing this in a seasonal league. Do not take Aaron Jones to the 2-9, but I have probably almost zero shares of it. I believe they're going to get an ownership percentage added in as a feature on underdogs. So, you know, if you have It'll show next to Aaron Jones. Like you have 0% ownership of Aaron Jones. Good to diversify the revenue because if you're wrong, he goes off, you lose a lot of money. But you got him on a couple teams, bing, bang, boom, things go good. Okay, so George Kittle. A lot of people like to talk about having the positional advantage at tight end. I understand that just straight up getting one of those elite guys, the Travis Kelsey's, to George Kittle's, to Mark Andrews makes sense. From a team building standpoint this year, though, from a game theory standpoint in fantasy football, your roster construction ends up being kind of fucked up when you take a tight end early. Now, it could work in best ball because you're going to pass up on a running back for that tight end early, and then you can just stack you know, four or five mid-tier running backs. And on a weekly basis, you don't have to decide who to start, right? The software automatically does that for you. So you can get by. You could scrape by doing that. However, in a seasonal league, I'm not a fan of doing that because you're letting go too much talent at the running back position where the advantage at the position drops off so heavily once you hit you know a certain round if I were to take a tight end then my running back two would be like Todd Gurley or some shit you know obviously I like Carson Gordon and Fournette more than Gurley so it wouldn't actually be Gurley but you all get the point I feel a lot safer with a better running back in my running back two slot but once we get into the third round, since I already have two really good running backs, like I get my choice of all of these guys as my wide receiver one, which makes me feel nice and warm and, and fuzzy and cozy inside. And I love me some Allen Robinson. I went in depth on Allen Robinson in the must own wide receivers video a couple days ago. Allen Robinson, again, guys, I can't echo this loud enough. He had 154 targets last year. The only two players in the NFL that had more targets than Allen Robinson last year were Michael Thomas and Julio Jones. I understand his targets are not necessarily as valuable because of the quarterback that's throwing him the ball. But guys, why pay a premium price for the exact same volume? That's my question. Allen Robinson is a lock, again, to get 140, 150 targets. He is far removed from that ACL tear. He looks as explosive as ever. And I am happy to get him as my wide receiver one in round three. Now, George Kittle, this is where I'm a little skeptical it can go both ways because if Debo Samuel lands on the pup list and I also want to clarify you're seeing a lot of names thrown around with the pup right now almost everyone that you're seeing attached to the pup list at this point in time you know if you're on Twitter or whatever they're placing them on the active pup list which doesn't mean anything it doesn't mean they're missing the first six games of the season it puts them on the pup list to open up a roster spot but they can be activated from the pup list at any time if they're on the active pup list it doesn't actually mean anything. It just means they're putting them aside for right now and they can be activated at any time. Once the actual pup list deadline hits, then that means they will be missing the first six games of the season. So when you see pup being thrown around right now, it doesn't mean much. However, with George Kittle, 
I want to first off move my dumb ass out of the picture. Second off, I want to highlight the work of oh, this is locked, huh? Let me unlock this bench. What the what what in tarnation? I want to highlight the work of this dude, Edwin Porras. It's cool. It's cool to see that like so many people in different industries are doing so much cool work in the fantasy industry. And as, as we're getting more doctors flooded into the industry, we're getting a lot of context. And you guys know Dr. Jesse Morse does a fantastic job. He's the doctor that we typically bring on to the show to help put context behind the injuries. But this dude, Edwin, who works for Fantasy Points, uh, has been doing a fantastic job on Twitter, giving out value, giving out really valuable information when it comes to players and putting context behind the injuries. So if you're on Twitter, I would very, very, very strongly suggest going to follow him at FB Injury Doc. And something he put out about Kittle the other day concerns me. George Kittle's shoulder last year dislocated his shoulder and suffered a torn labrum. Edwin tweeted out that shoulder redo dislocation rates, 42 to 55% without surgery, 13 to 26% with surgery. He did not have the surgery, which means he's going into this year with a re-dislocation rate at a coin flip rate. 50% basically, okay? So he has a coin flip rate of re-dislocating that surgery based on the context we know of a 25-year fucking sample size of injuries that have happened to athletes and the actual rate of them happening again. We're going to get back to that in a minute after I have my pick. So right now, we started off Zeke, we started off Aaron Jones, we started off Allen Robinson. Y'all know I'm not a big fan of Leonard Fournette, but I will smash that fucking buy button if he lands me at the 4-9 and daddy flex God, you fucking timed out and took him from me like a real cunt you are. But that's fine because we're stuck here at the 4-9 with a beautiful, beautiful plethora of wide receiver options. You all know I love Terry. You know I love DJ Chark. I'm going to grab DJ Chark just because I've been grabbing Terry everywhere. And again, we diversify. I have a lot of DJ Chark. I have a lot of Terry McLaurin. Those are the two guys I find myself drafting when I'm at the back of the fourth round or early fifth round over and over again. You know, when I have the choices of Tyler Lockett, McLaurin, DK Metcalf, Cortland Sutton, this tier of wide receivers, I usually almost always pick one of McLaurin and DJ Chark. I think DJ Chark is in this offense where they're going to have to throw the ball 775 times. Jay Gruden coming in at the offensive coordinator position. I think we're going to see DJ Chark move around a lot. I think we're going to see him operate very similar to how Jay Gruden used AJ Green, right? I've, I've echoed this many times. AJ Green's first three years in the league were Jay Gruden's three years as the offensive coordinator in Cincinnati. God, I hope DK Metcalf falls to me here. Give me DK. Give me DK, give me DK, because then I can stack him to Russell Wilson on the way. Bike! Al Johnson, don't you do this to me, boy. What kind of running back action do we got here? Ooh, I don't hate DeAndre Swift either. I would like, he's going to time out too. God damn it! That It's getting so tough to get those wide receivers here now. Now there's like kind of a drop off in tier for me at, at wide receiver, and I'm thinking about pivoting over to... I have actually no shares of Zach Ertz. I don't know why. I just I don't think anyone has a good feeling about Zach Ertz this year. I love DeAndre Swift, man. I, I wrote about him for like 45 minutes in the Big Dogs Bible, which is dropping. If you're watching this on Thursday, oh, it comes out tomorrow, which means I got to get my ass to finishing it. So basically, back to DJ Chark. Sorry, my mock drafts are all over the fucking place. If you've ever watched them, you know that already. Don't do drugs, kids. DJ Chark in this offense is going to throw the ball a ton of times. Again, the AJ Green, Jay, Jay Gruden narrative is perfect. The statistics that DJ Chark put up last year are eerily similar to what AJ Green did in his rookie year. And AJ Green took a monster next step in his sophomore season. It was arguably the best season of his career. He had like 165 targets. Let's fucking pull it up right now. AJ Green, FF. Skirt. A little shortcut plug here. The best way to find out a, a fantasy player statistics is just type in that player's name and then put FF at the end of it. And it's always the first option on Google, FF today. Look at that second season. His first three seasons were AJ Green under Jay Gruden. First three seasons were probably his best three seasons as a pro. His second season, 164, 97, 13, 50, 11. Season after that, 180, 98, 14, 26, 11. We're going to see a lot of the same usage with DJ Chark that AJ Green got. That is why I love DJ Chark. I mean, Terry McLaurin is the obvious lover boy of my summer because he's going to see 100,000 targets this year. He is the true, he is Robert Woods that runs a 4 3 5 40. That is how I look at him. He's not only a deep threat, which he is, right? He can pop off for 70 yards on any given play, but he also is a fantastic possession receiver. Single highest contested catch rate of all NFL wide receivers last year, Terry McLaurin. Single highest contested catch rate. Matt Harmon's reception perception. 
had him ranked as one of the highest scoring rookie wide receivers of all time against man and press coverage. That is usually a predictive measure of how good an NFL receiver would be. It's amongst guys like the Stefan Diggs, the Antonio Browns, those kind of guys. Going back to George Kittle, though, the redislocation rate is extremely, extremely high. And I like to go risk averse in the first few rounds because those are going to be the anchors. of the, the majority of your fantasy points is coming from the guys that you that you safely pick in the first few rounds. I don't like risk. I think tight end in itself is a risk because it sets you up to have a team that you don't necessarily love. That's risky in itself. But George Kittle is also risky because of this fucking fact. We put context behind injuries, and this is serving you context on a silver fucking platter. This is the same thing that happened with Anthony Miller. Anthony Miller's shoulder keeps re-injuring itself. This is the same thing he suffered with and keeps re-injuring, okay? So George Kittle is going through the same thing Anthony Miller did. And Anthony Miller had the surgery which puts his percentage of getting re-injured or re-dislocated much lower. George Kittle did not have the surgery, which is what worries me. And again, it's a it's a coin flip. So there is a possibility that he doesn't re-dislocate it and that he balls out because Debo Samuel's not healthy, and I'm wrong here. But it's not about being right or wrong. It's about giving you the highest percentage chance of making the right play here in fantasy. And I think that George Kittle is... No one's talking about this injury. No one is talking about it except for the homie Edwin Boris. Make sure you're following him at FB Injury Doc. So George Kittle scares me, man. He really, really does. And now we are sitting here in the... See, this is why, man. I actually really like... The end of the sixth round seems like so much value left to me on the board in best ball leagues. Oh, uh, man, I really want it. Daddy Flex God, you are fucking... I'm getting sniped left and right here. Last pick, I wanted DK Metcalf. This one, I was probably going to go with Tyler Boyd. I don't love the value left at wide receiver here. I love Darren Waller this year, man. I'm not... I don't love the early tight ends. I don't love mid-round tight ends either. But if there's one I'm targeting, it's Darren Waller, man. It really, really is. I'm going to take him here. I wanted to take a quarterback because Russell Wilson and Deshaun Watson are in that elite tier that remain. You know, there's six quarterbacks in in the top tiers, right? Mahomes and Lamar Jackson are in their own tier. But after that, you have Kyler, Dak, Russell Wilson, Deshaun Watson. If any of them ended up being the MVP this year, wouldn't surprise me whatsoever. I think those six are the are the guys you want to target. And the reason I didn't take one here and I wanted to roll the dice is because I saw there's one, two, three, four, five, six picks in between myself and the next pick where I can get one of those quarterbacks. And this guy already has a quarterback. So I highly doubt he doubles down and takes two quarterbacks within the first six picks. So that leaves me a good chance of landing at least one of these guys. And the reason I wanted DK Metcalf is because I knew I would be able to get Russell Wilson most likely at one of these picks. Had I got DK Metcalf, I probably would have taken Wilson at the 6'9". But I didn't. So we'll just take whoever falls to me here. I think there's this elite gap that you get one of these guys and then you can grab another later round quarterback. And I'm fine doing that in one quarterback leagues. I think there's a lot of value at the end of the sixth, early seventh to grab one of those top six quarterbacks. Who, whichever one falls to you, I'm fine with. I hate all these picks right here. Jarvis Landry, the hip injury is scary, man. The hip injury is very, 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 very scary to me. I'm really glad I grabbed most of my running backs now. Zeke, Aaron Jones, DeAndre Swift, because it is fucking ugly down there. I think people are still sleeping on Julian Edelman, too. I think he had like 150 targets last year, some absurd number that went way under the radar. So this is why. like, I feel like the value on the board right now is by far and away, the quarterback one here. And this is where I would diversify. Sometimes I take Russ. Sometimes I take Deshaun Watson. I think uh, I think the last like two drafts I've taken Russ. So I'm going to go with Deshaun Watson here. And uh, let me run through. Jarvis Landry had a hip surgery, which is a seven to 10 month recovery timetable. He's going to be eerily close to hitting that timetable at the beginning of the season. So there's a very good chance he comes into the season at less than 100%. If not, he's already on the active pup list. So there's a chance he hits the pup list, the real pup list. And that would obviously be an issue if you drafted Jarvis Landry this early. So the hip is, is a very, very real concern there for Jarvis Landry. That was a serious injury. Michael Gallup, adding C.D. Lamb, who I think was the most talented wide receiver in this draft class, is concerning to me. And I had a comment about C.D. Lamb on my video Was it yesterday or two days ago? Whatever. And they were like, dude, 1,100 yards in his sophomore season. He was incredible. And yes, like those raw stats are really, really impressive. But here's the thing. When you have an offense that throws for over almost 5,000 yards, you have to put that into context too. You have to put that into the narrative. So while he had an awesome fucking year last year, for sure, when you look at the actual dominator rating, in terms of like the percentage of total team receiving yards and team receiving touchdowns, Michael Gallup ranked 45th among wide receivers. So in terms of like his share of the offense on the, on Dallas's offense, you know, you want to look at things relative to other offenses. So yes, it's like cool that 
he went up for a thousand eleven hundred yards but does that mean he really had an awesome offensive season productive relative to what the overall cowboys season was right because if you give him that same dominator rating but the cowboys passing offense goes for 4400 yards next year guess what he's gonna have 800 yards and five touchdowns or something like that so it's important to put context behind just raw statistics right and this is playerprofiler.com where they have all of these fantastico uh advanced analytics for you to work off of and that is one of them the dominator rating is sort of telling so yes michael gallup's raw numbers were very good last year but with cd lamb coming in who i think is more talented than michael gallup he's gonna have a hard time repeating it so i don't love michael gallup that early in the draft devin singletary is a guy who i'd much rather just take zach moss in the 10th round aj green i'm good evan ingram will be playing with a screw in his foot for the year so that terrifies me that's what we had marquise hollywood brown doing last year and it's the reason why he only played on 50 percent of the snaps and see this is why you take deshaun watson or russell wilson here because one of them is going to go off the board so is the other one and then a little bit of a quarterback run starts you have josh allen who in my opinion is a whole ass tier below these guys. So I, I really, really like my draft so far. Sean Watson, Zeke, Aaron Jones, DeAndre Swift, Al Robinson, DJ Chark, Darren Waller. Back to Darren Waller, the GOAT. He's the only mid-round tight end that I will have a ton of shares of. Guys, this is exactly what we look for in a breakout tight end. Look at those fucking athletic numbers here. 446 at 66, 255. Why did he break out at age 27? Because he was a crackhead. Sorry, there's no other way to put it. He did not focus on football. And when he finally changed his focus, look what happened last year. His college yards, we always knew he was a big play receiver. College dominator in the 91st percentile. He made up 32% of his college receiving yards and touchdowns. 17 yards per reception. I, the yards per reception number is very telling coming out of college of how good of a playmaker you are, like downfield, right? It's usually predictive. You look at like Mike Kosicki, right? Everyone likes to tout Mike Kosicki as a as a like later round breakout wide receiver or tight end. Sorry, excuse me. And I'm on the clock real quick. Wait up, wait up, wait up. Do we love any of these running backs? Probably not in the eighth round. I don't have a lot of shares of Deontay Johnson, man. I don't because he keeps moving up draft boards. I'll take him at the end of the eighth round because I do not have a lot of shares of him. We've had a lot of encouraging reports coming out about Big Ben and him throwing and feeling good and everything. And if that's the case... Love me some Deontay Johnson this year. But back to Darren Waller, man. So Mike Kosicki, despite all these athleticism traits, if you can't, like, what, what is the point of having the 40-yard dash? What is the point of having agility and, and this crazy burst if when you're actually on the field, you don't use it? You're not breaking tackles and you're not using that long speed to break away and make big plays. You look at the college yards per reception, 9.9, .9, which is in the 11th percentile. The 11th percentile in in not a good way. And then you look at last year. Yes, he got a lot of targets. The volume was there. But in terms of actual plays with the ball in his hand, like 37th in target separation, the average distance that he created between himself and the defender, this guy just didn't make plays with the ball in his hands. I want to highlight that with some advanced statistics because, you know, yards after catch, 1.9 yards after catch per target. That's horrible. That's really bad. And it makes sense why his yards per reception in college were so low because he doesn't make plays after the catch. So if he's not getting the volume, you're going to have a problem with Mike Kosicki because he does not make those plays downfield. He does not make big plays. He does not move well with the ball in his hands. There's a reason why his 6.4 yards per target ranked 30th in the NFL. His yards per pass route run 34th in the NFL. I'm telling you guys, he is a mirage when it comes to being an actual playmaker. Those athletics do not translate to on the field. All right. Did we miss Zach Moss? No, we didn't miss Zach Moss. I don't know. I'm getting higher and higher and higher on this dude, Zach Moss, and I cannot stop drafting him. Though I'm pretty set at running back, so I don't know if I necessarily need to draft. Oh, no, I wanted Zach Moss, and we just timed out, huh? Okay, Darius Slayton was probably going to be my other pick, to be honest with you. So I don't hate it, but I did want Zach Moss there a little bit. But Slayton gives us that week-to-week -week upside. And the thing with Slayton... I've talked about this a few times in some of my videos. Very hard to put context behind the Giants offense. We have such small sample sizes when it comes to all of the actual playmakers being on the field together. Three games. Uh, we have five games in total in which, was it five games? Yeah, I think it's five games in total where Slayton, Golden Tate, and Sterling Shepard all played on more than 50% of the snaps. So all three of them were on the field together, right? In that sample size, Sterling Shepard dominated the other receivers in targets and receptions, but Darius Slayton dominated in receiving touchdowns and receiving yards. The problem with that is Evan Ingram was only on the field for one of those games, and Saquon Barkley missed one of those games. So it's like we don't know what it's going to look like when all those guys are on the field together. But if I'm choosing someone 
you know, I talk about late round upside. If I'm I'm if I'm in the ninth, tenth plus roundage, I'm not looking for guys to continue to put up four floor plays on my bench. And this is more season long than best ball. But when you're in a season long league, right, you get your starters and then everyone else on your bench is just that. They're a bench player, right? There's a reason they're not in your starting lineup because they're not putting up more points than the guys in the starting lineup. To grab a guy like Golden Tate, who's going to put up eight to 10 fantasy points a week, but never crack your lineup doesn't make sense, right? Who cares about a floor that's sitting on your bench? What you want to do is give yourself the opportunity for your bench players to go off and actually show upside that gets them into the starting lineup. You want guys on your bench that have tons of upside because maybe they do take over a starting slot role in your starting lineup, in your fantasy lineup, I'm referring to, right? You don't want the floor plays on your bench. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't do you any good to have those guys because if they hit, they're not hitting anything. They're just hitting their floor. But if the upside guys hit, then guess what? They're, they're cracking your starting lineup. I think Darius Slayton has a path to become the number one wide receiver in New York. So I really like his upside. Um, and I'm actually starting to like him more in season leagues than I had for a while because of that upside and just because of the strategy of, of drafting players overall. The other thing I wanted to look at was player profilers tool of, of data analysis is really, 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 really fucking cool. What they allow you to do if you're a member on their website is all of those stats that are on the sheet right here, you can actually download and export. And you just go to this da data analysis tool if you're a member on their site. And typically I'll look at players and you can put them into like thresholds, right? And kind of put them into a comparable group with other people. And I'll do that in a second after I make my next pick. Ah, so I missed Zach Moss. Where did he go off the board? He went off like four or five picks after me to the fantasy guy. You motherfucker. Okay, so we missed our running back there. Any tight ends I love? Not necessarily. Any quarterbacks I love? Eh. I'm going to grab Boston Scott here. Y'all know I like Miles Sanders just about as much as anybody there. But I've echoed this many times. Both of them are going to catch a lot of passes this year. We don't need it to be one or the other. We don't need Miles Sanders to be shitty because Boston Scott might catch four passes a week. We saw in those four games where Boston Scott was on the field and doing his thing, Miles Sanders saw 22 targets in those four games while leaving one of those halfway through a game. Boston Scott saw 23 targets in the four games. So both of them were averaging five and a half to six targets a game when Boston Scott went off. Boston Scott has some upside. Boston Scott has a lot of pass catching ability. Both of them can do well this year. So I'm actually starting to draft a lot of Boston Scott here at the 117th pick. I think he's a phenomenal uh, best ball pick here. If something does happen to Miles Sanders, y'all really thought I was going to finish that sentence. We don't do that. We don't do that shit. If something happens to fuck that. All right. So with a guy like Darren Waller, what I would like to do is, you know, you pick the position. So I went to tight end and I'll do this is supposed to be weight adjusted speed score. I'm not sure why it says that, but weight adjusted speed score, uh, college yards per reception, college do dominator rating. So we want to look at like what he was as a prospect and then last year. So deep targets per game. Let's let's do the dominator rating for last year as well. Fantasy points per target, fantasy points per route run. Let's get the results here. So what I would typically do, you could just look at it and filter it this way, but you can also click this download table button here and you could make it into an Excel sheet. You'll see it download there and open it. I don't think it will screen record because I'm currently screen recording a bra the browser. Oh, they took Tony Pollard for me. I hate that pick. Damn it, Tony. Ugh, that's weird. I have Zeke. So they drafted Tony Pollard, which basically puts me up. You don't play for floor in best ball. That's the problem. You don't play for floor. You want to win the goddamn league. And drafting a handcuff is more of a season league play. because so you don't want to be sca scavenging for the waiver wire. I'm trying to get Tony Pollard here. There is no waiver wire. Ugh. Okay, so I hate that pick, but whatever. We rounded out our running backs. At least we're getting the RB1 in Dallas, regardless of who it may be. So typically I would export this and then you could put thresholds into players and give yourself a better idea of the comparable players that a guy like Darren Waller might fit into. Now I have the Excel sheet on the top of my computer right now. You look at all the statistics I exported. I'm going to filter all the players who are in the top half of all of those categories. When we filter it that way, I'll get to the results after my pick because I'm almost up in a second. So we've got one quarterback. We've Got five running backs, four wide receivers. Is there anyone I love? Oh, okay, 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 okay. There is somebody I love right now, and he's one of the single best values in best ball drafts right now, and it's Michael Pittman. Michael Pittman is one of my favorite prospects coming out this year, and I'm, I'm going to forever regret drafting T. Higgins over Michael Pittman in rookie drafts this year. Soon as I made the pick in the Go Fade Me Dynasty League of T. Higgins over Michael Pittman in the rookie draft, I immediately, I was on camera when I said it. I was like, fuck this. I fucked up. Fuck me, fuck you, fuck you. So Michael Pittman, man, is baller of a prospect. They loved him. The Colts took him over 
Jonathan Taylor with their first second round pick. They thought he was the most important piece adding to their offense. And now we have T.Y. Hilton injuring his hamstring. We do not like August hamstring injuries, people. Too close to the season. Players push themselves too much, and it lingers throughout most of the season. And we know T.Y. Hilton is no stranger to the hamstring pull, no stranger to the ankle injuries, no stranger to anything resembling a fucking injury. T.Y. Hilton is a walking injury. They have no one else that can command wide receiver one type targets or be the wide receiver one in this offense, except for Michael Pittman. The fact that T.Y. Hilton is already injured makes Michael Pittman arguably the single best rookie value pick in drafts right now. I love Michael Pittman where he's going. I also really like Alan Lazard now that Devin Funch has opted out and there's been a lot of buzz around him. So I'm going to grab Alan Lazard if he falls to me here. And yes, like how are you going to take Jack Doyle over Alan Lazard? That's just disrespectful. Okay, so the team. Yeah, the running backs. I'm glad I got the upside running backs in the beginning. So right now we have Deshaun Watson at the quarterback. Zeke, Aaron Jones, DeAndre Swift, Boston Scott, Tony Pollard at running back. Allen Robinson, DJ Chark, Deontay Johnson, Darius Slayton, Michael Pittman, Allen Lazard as our wide receivers, and Darren Waller as a tight end. So looking at the tight end list, going back to the export that I had, we narrowed it down to the top half of guys in weight adjusted speed score, which is predictive of NFL success. Top half of guys in yards per reception, college dominator rating, dominator rating in the NFL, fantasy points per target, and yards per pass route run. The list goes like this. George Kittle, Evan Ingram, Hunter Henry, Travis Kelsey, Darren Waller, Noah Fant, Vernon Davis, TJ Hawkinson, David Njoku, a few other players that fall in line with that list. My case for Darren Waller, honestly, it doesn't need to be made. People need to make the case for why he's not. Anytime you find yourself arguing all these reasons about someone who just produced on the field and balled the fuck out, and you have to tell yourself why you shouldn't be drafting him, I think you need to change your mindset. The other tight ends, like you're having to make the case for why you should draft him. He's coming off of a ridiculous breakout season, and we're all trying to tell ourselves why he's not good. But he is fucking good. Because he. I understand there weren't any other targets there last year. Darren Waller is exactly what we look for in a breakout tight end. Like, look at these fucking numbers. 99th percentile speed score, 40-yard dash score, 90th percentile burst, agility, so he makes plays after the catch. Yards after the catch, number two. Remember Mike Kosicki's 1.9 yards after the catch per target? Darren Waller, 4.8 yards per catch after the target. Completed air yards, fourth in the NFL. Receptions, number two. Receiving yards, number two. Yards per pass route, number... Guys, guys, the, the, the profile is screaming at you that he's an elite tight end in fantasy. And maybe the volume is not as high as you'd like it, but I'm telling you, you're not going to be disappointed with a Darren Waller pick. This is a guy who can who can make your entire fantasy week with one play. Those are the guys you're looking for, right? If you're looking for a Zach Ertz or a Hunter Henry, you need the volume in order for that to, to for that to work and that to have ROI on that investment because they don't make plays after the catch. With a Darren Waller, he had three touchdowns last year and still finished as a tight end three. Imagine he had six or seven. He'd be up there with Kelsey. He'd be up. We'd be debating him as one of the top three tight ends. And you're getting him as the tight end six or seven, three or four, five rounds later than the top. I'm, I'm telling you, Darren Waller is the single best mid-round value pick of tight ends. Probably the best value of the top 10 tight ends outside of Jared Cook, who I also love. But do not fade Darren Waller. I'm telling you, you're going to be doing yourself a disservice if you fade Darren Waller. This is a Darren Waller stand show from now on. Let's get back to the draft. We are in the 14th round and... Uh, and make sure, if you haven't already signed up or downloaded the app, which will be linked in the description, that you do so, Underdog Fantasy. I will send out invites in the Discord channel as well as on Twitter. So make sure you're following me there. And make sure you sign up for the Discord channel through Patreon. Patreon.com slash BDGE. Where are we at? We need a second tight end. We don't really need any wide receivers. We need another quarterback. Okay, you know what? I'm going to take Jimmy G because I have zero shares of him. And I do want to talk about Jimmy G for a second. I'm not a big fan of Jimmy G as a fantasy quarterback. However... He did okay last year, and now he's two years removed from the ACL. And there was a report that came out this morning, I believe it was. Let me hop onto Roto World real quick. Jimothy Garoppolo. Speaking Tuesday, Jimmy Garoppolo admitted his knee feels night and day better than it did in 2019. It's able to do whatever it needs to do at this point, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, you know, one of the things we always talk about when it comes to putting context behind injuries is that we want players two years removed from their ACL, not one year. And if I'm going to be objective, if I'm going to use that point 
for all of the players, right? It's the reason we liked Dalvin Cook last year, et cetera. It's the reason we liked Allen Robinson. You have to be, you have to be objective with it. And Jimmy G falls into that category. Last year, maybe he was limited by the knee. He says he feels night and day better than he did last year. Now he's going to be two years removed from the ACL. There's a very good chance that that whole fucking narrative is being underplayed. And Jimmy G is a much stronger quarterback this year because of the knee being two years removed from the ACL. So that single-handedly has made me a little bit higher on Jimmy G because I use, I push that for guys I like. I have to push it for guys I don't like as well, right? We got to be objective here. So pairing Deshaun and Jimmy G gives me two quarterbacks. And sometimes I take three quarterbacks. Sometimes I take three tight ends, depending on the makeup of my team right now. A lot of the times I'm a moron. I'll take two quarterbacks on the same bye week, which means I need to take a third quarterback. But just make sure you don't do that. Oh, give me all the Anthony McFarland. Give me it all. All of it. 15th round. Yes, sir. You know how much I love run AMC as a prospect. I want to bring up another tweet. This is actually, I think, from Edwin. Let me see if I can find it. Sorry, this is going to be annoying for you guys as I scroll down here, but I promise it's worth it. This dude, Nick Whalen, tweeted out, if you think Anthony McFarlane is too small to be an NFL starting running back, you need to think about others as well. Combine measurements, which to my delight, McFarlane came in at 208 pounds, literally the same size as Dobbins and Clyde Edwards Hilaire. And Edwin tweeted out, some more fucking fantastic context. A 10-year study of 275 running backs found no difference in durability based on height, weight, BMI, and age. All running backs who saw at least 150 carries fell within these ranges. 22 to 28 years old, 5'8 to 6'1, 207 pounds to 243 pounds, and then the BMI. Disclaimer, the study was based on carries, not touches. So the size had no relevance to actual injuries in the NFL, which was pretty cool to see, especially for, for those of us that like the Aaron Joneses, for those of us. I mean, look at my fucking running back group right now. Aaron Jones, DeAndre Swift, Boston Scott, Anthony McFarland. None of those guys are 220 pounds. They're not the typical backs, but we don't have to worry about them being injured because we know the study shows us that they don't give an advanced rate of injury. So when James Conner goes down and Anthony McFarland takes over that backfield and breaks the fuck out everywhere, y'all will be happy you drafted him. And I'm happy I drafted him. Now I need to go with tight ends. <clears throat> and I don't understand how Dawson Knox is still going below guys like OJ Howard, who's like about to be the third tight end on his team. Greg Olson's also about to be the second or third tight end on his team because Will Disley is back from injury. He has been cleared for physical activity. I'm not taking him. I'm not even going to pull up another Edwin tweet, but he's got another fantastic tweet about Will Disley and the explosiveness that you lose from both patellar tendon tears and Achilles tears. And Will Disley has had both of them in back to bike years. Uh, so we're not going with Will Disley. We're definitely not going with Greg Olson. Now, my later round tight ends that I do like this target here, I think Jay Sternberger and Dawson Knox are the two guys or one of the two guys I hope fall to me here. Jay Sternberger basically has a clear path to being the starting tight end there with Jimmy Graham gone. They don't have Devin Funches again. They don't have a clear second target. I mean, it probably is Aaron Jones, I would say. But like outside of just dump offs, I mean, Aaron Rodgers wants to be slinging the ball this year. He's heard he's heard the people chirping about how he's not a top 10 quarterback anymore, about how he's fallen down the NFL 100 list. People don't believe him anymore. Aaron Rodgers, he's got a bit of an anger issue. He's low key, probably the, the angriest person on the inside of all time. And guess what? That's going to equate to Jay Sternberger points. I don't know how. One way or another, it's going to happen. So I like Jay Sternberger, and I like Dawson Knox. Dawson Knox is the, the tight end there. Uh, by, all, by all accounts, I mean, the raw numbers are not fantastic, right? 50 targets, 28 receptions, 388 yards, two touchdowns. But most of those numbers ranked top five amongst rookie tight ends last year, if not top three. I know the targets was up there. The receptions were up there. And then in terms of like explosive plays, yards per target, yards per reception, he was amongst some of the best rookie tight ends in the NFL. So Dawson Knox showed a lot of explosive plays. He's just very, very raw. He's a raw athlete that didn't do much in college because he went to college at South Carolina where he was competing, or Old Miss, excuse me, where he was competing with DK Metcalf and AJ Brown for targets. So obviously he's not going to put up a lot of production on the field. So look at those athletics on the right side over there. 86 percentile weight adjusted speed score, burst agility is all there. His yards per reception was in the 60th percentile for college. So we know he was a playmaker in college when he did get the ball. Number six in deep targets last year. Low key, low key, low key. This is not just among rookie tight ends. This is among all tight ends. Deep targets, he was getting them. Yards per target, number 14. Yards per reception, number three in the entire NFL. So this guy low key balled out last year. But again, he's raw, which is why you see his drop rate rank very high. A lot of drops because he's just an athlete out there trying to make plays. But 50% contested catch rate is very, very high for tight ends. Very, very high overall for any players. So that fucking, mo I got to stop timing out. 
They're giving me Devonta fucking Freeman. God damn it. Everybody in this draft knows that that was fucking absolutely the most nonsensical pick of all time. I would have never, ever draft Devonta Freeman in a best ball right now. And then Jay Sternberger goes off the board right after me. I bet you Dawson Knox doesn't fall back to me. I'm going to be fucking pissed. I'm going to be pissed. Fuck, I should have put him in my queue. I'm an idiot. They literally have a star button there for reasons like that. So we're going to put Dawson Knox in the queue. And then when he gets sniped and I don't end up fucking getting him, we're going to put Muhammad Sanu and we're going to put Russell Gage in the queue. Because both of those guys are low-key candidates to see 80 to 90 targets this year. Gives you a nice little floor play in best ball. Again, in season long, we don't pick those guys. But in best ball, we don't hate those guys. Dawson Knox, baller. Draft him. How are you going to take Greg Olson there? Love that. Why are you taking four tight ends, too? It's kind of ugly, bro. Come on, DeSanto. You're better than that. You're better than that. So we are coming on my last two picks. We got hella running backs, man. I think I fucked up this team. I think I... No, I didn't want Devonta Freeman, but they done did it to me. Make sure y'all sign up on Underdog Fantasy. And make sure you're following me on Twitter and Instagram, which are listed right there. You can see it moving around the screen right now. Make sure that you cop the draft guide, which is live right now. And you can literally get it for $10. Don't buy Starbucks coffee for the next two days and you can afford the draft guide by going to monkeyknifefight.com and using the promo code BDGE when you sign up. I'm getting so many emails like, oh, I forgot to use the promo code BDGE. Guys, I can't, I can't help you there. I can't I can't help you. If you don't use BDGE, it doesn't register. Like if you forget to use the promo code BDGE, what do you want me to do? I don't have access to Monkey Knife Fight's backend servers. I can't go in there and physically put the promo code in. So when you deposit 10 bucks on Monkey Knife Fight, Got to make sure you use the promo code BDGE. Don't sleep on Brian Hill. Do not sleep on Brian Hill taking away carries from Todd Gurley this year. That'll be one of my bold predictions. Brian Hill outscores Todd Gurley in fantasy football 2020. Sit on that. Okay, we are almost coming to an end here. This is my last pick. I will probably use it on a... I think I probably need more help at tight end. Two of my fucking picks were timeouts, so my team would have turned out differently. Unfortunately, it didn't. Uh, the only quarterback probably worth drafting here would be Tyrod, but I don't like to draft a quarterback that I know is going to eventually end up getting benched because that's how this shit works, all right? Never do we see rookie QBs sit behind veterans for the entire year without them being a good team. If they're a shit team, the leash is too small. CJ Ozoma, that's who I'm going with as long as I'm just not overlapping by. Okay, so we've got three different bye weeks for the tight ends. Everybody's sleeping on Ozoma. I think he's going to be a starting tight end in this Cincinnati offense, and Ozoma is a baller, at least from a weight-adjusted speed score standpoint. 90th percentile, 467 at 263 pounds. I think he's low-key, not the worst player. I think he's not the worst player. It's great analysis by me, right? I think CJ Ozuma, I think you're going to see him crack a few starting lineups this year in fantasy. I think he's a good athlete. I think Joe Burrow throws to the tight end a lot. And I think Ozuma is in line to be the starting tight end there. And no one is talking about any tight end in Cincinnati. We want to talk about all these weapons that are going to get a boost with Joe Burrow being there. Why not the tight end position? Why not CJ? Okay. That's the last pick of my last round. And we're actually on the mystery relevant pick. Eight wide receivers, one quarterback. That's an interesting team uh, makeup there, R. DeSanto. Don't know about that one, sir. If you guys enjoyed this, make sure you hit the thumbs up button. Make sure you go sign up for Underdog Fantasy. Again, I will link the apps down below. I will link iOS, Android, Google for you to go download them. And make sure that when you do deposit, throw in the Big Dogs promo partner. I have a code thing here. You're going to throw $10 down and this will be the next page that pops up. So make sure you do that. Let them know that I sent you. And this is my final team. Sean Watson and Jimmy G at quarterback. Zeke, Jones, DeAndre Swift, Boston Scott, Tony Pollard, AMC, Devonta Freeman, A-Rob, DJ Chark, Deontay Johnson, Darius Slayton, Michael Pittman Jr., Lazard. I really like the depth at wide receiver. Not very top-heavy, but that's what happens when you take three running backs in your first five picks. And then we have Darren Waller, Dawson Knox, CJ Ozoma. Not my favorite team, but not the worst team for sure. But I've got about 7,000 leagues going on. That's what happens when you join Underdog. I'm telling you, they're so fucking addicting. They just suck you in and you can't do anything about it. Before you know, your entire paycheck, your entire Trump check is going straight to Underdog Fantasy. I love y'all. I'm out. Goodbye.